Um, so thank you and welcome to today's reading. Um, so we're going to be reading The Animals of Farthing Wood and this is by Colin Dan. Um, the illustrations inside are by Jacqueline Tetmar and the cover is actually by a different artist, make sure I get this right, Sam Usher did this, uh, did this one. It's quite bright, sorry. But it's a beautiful cover. Um, many of the, you will obviously recognise the name of this one from the children's TV show um, cartoon, which I absolutely adored and I thought it was brilliant. And I'm sure a lot of you guys enjoyed it too. So we're going to be reading a bit of the origin story. So just a little back story for anyone who didn't know. Um, the original Animals of Farthingwood is actually a collective name of two separate books. Um, and then we've got uh, the first one, which kind of comes in, in the first set, and it's called Escape from Danger. And then the other one was Journey to White Deer Park. But eventually they got put together and collectively known as the Animals of Farthingwood. So I really do hope that you enjoy that. So um, thank you for joining me. Thank you for joining Pooh Bear. We're back to normal attire. Um, because it is locked down, we have his mask all safe and ready in case he needs to go out. We'll keep that down there. We're indoors today. And of course we've got our mug from our friend M. And one thing I'd like to point out about this book, which some people may not know, is um, as usual, most books have a dedication, which is really nice. This particular one is dedicated to Janet, which you can't see. But what's quite nice is that um, we would like to, me and Pooh Bear, would like to wish a very special happy birthday to ja to our Janet. So um, we really hope you enjoy the story. So let's get started. And it's book one, or part one, really, Escape from Danger, chapter one, Drought. For most of the animals of Farthing Wood, a new day was beginning. The sun had set and the hot, moistureless air was at last cooling a little. It was dusk, and for Badger, time for activity. So, lovely Jacqueline Tetmar illustration there. Leaving his comfortable underground sleeping chamber, lined with dry leaves and grass, he ambled along the connecting tunnel to the exit and paused, sniffing the wet air wearily. Moving his head in all directions, his powerful sense of smell soon told him no danger was present, and he emerged from the hole. Badger's set was on a sloping piece of ground in a clearing of the wood, and the earth here was now as hard as biscuit. No rain had fallen on Farthing Wood for nearly four weeks. Badger noticed Tawny Owl perched on a low branch of a beech tree a few yards away, so he trotted over for a few words, while he sharpened his claws on the trunk. Still no rain, he remarked unnecessarily, as he stretched upwards and raked the bark. I think it's been hotter today than ever to. Tawny Owl opened one eye and ruffled his feathers a little. They filled in the pond he said bluntly. Badger stopped scratching and dropped to all fours. His face striped took on a lot, look of alarm. I could hear the bulldozer moving around in the distance all day long, he said. But this is serious, very serious. He shook his head. I really don't know where we'll go to drink now. Tawny Owl did not reply. His head had swivelled and he was looking intently under the trees behind him. Presently, Badger's snout began sniffing again and he caught the scent of Fox who was approaching them. Fox's brush started to wag in greeting as he spotted his friends. He could guess from Badger's worried expression that he had heard the news. I've just been over there to look, he called as he ran up. Not a drop of water left. You wouldn't know there had ever been a pond. What can they be doing? asked Badger. Leveling the earth, I suppose, said Fox. They've cut down some more trees as well. Badger shook his head again. How long before... he began. Before they reach us, interrupted Tawny Owl. Could be this summer. 
Human destruction moves swiftly. What do you think, Fox? Tawny Owl's right. In another year, all of this could be concrete and brick. In five years, they've dug up the grassland and cut down three quarters of the wood. There are human dwellings on either side of us. We've been driven back and driven back, so that we're now like a bunch of rabbits cowering in the last stalks of a corn in the middle of the cornfield, listening to the approach of the harvester and knowing we've very soon got to run. And now they've taken our last proper water hole, groaned Badger. What can we do? We still have the stream at the foot of the hill, said Fox. It must be like a muddy trickle by now, retorted Badger, with all the animals in the wood using it. It'll be dry in a few days. Tawny Owl rustled his wings impatiently. Why don't you go and look, he suggested. There are sure to be others there. Perhaps someone will have an idea. Without another word, he jumped off the branch, flapped into, the, into flight and disappeared. The last faint rays of daylight were gone as Badger and Fox descended the slope into the depths of the wood. Everywhere the ground was baked hard and even the quivering leaves on the trees sounded brittle and dusty. Only the darkness around them was any comfort. That familiar noiseless darkness that enfolded the timid animals of Farthing Wood in a cloak of security. Badger and Fox trotted along, shoulder to shoulder, each wondering what they would find in the stream. Neither animal spoke. Eventually, they could see some movement ahead. A number of creatures were jostling together on the banks of the stream, milling about in a rather purposeless discord disconcerted manner. There was a family of field mice and about half a dozen rabbits, all of whom scuttled away when they saw Fox approaching. A number of hedgehogs remained. Some of them stood their ground, ground but the majority quickly rolled themselves up, projecting their spines in a precautionary way against two most powerful inhabitants of the wood. Tut tut, don't be alarmed. Badger reassured them. Fox and I have merely come to examine the stream. It's the only piece of water left to us now, you know. He smiled kindly. We're all in this together, big and small alike. There must be no... Um, um. He broke off, unable to find the right words. Differences of opinion, suggested Fox, with just the beginnings of a grin. Uh, quite, replied Badger. How diplomatic. He peered forward over the bank, and his weary eyes straining into the darkness. Oh dear, he exclaimed. Oh dear, oh dear. At this point, the rolled up hedgehogs unrolled themselves, and the young ones began to squeak excitedly. It's dried up, all dried up. From under the trees, and from the entrance of their burrows, the rabbits edged forward again wondering what the clever fox and experienced badger would decide to do. One by one they seated themselves, still a little nervously on the bank, keeping in a group as they watched fox and badger discussing the situation. The field mice returned too, and pretty soon their noses, like the rabbits, were all twitching expectantly. There will have to be an assembly, Fox was saying. Everyone must attend. We ought to discuss this problem together so that everyone will be able to put forward their ideas. Badger nodded. Yes, it must be held without delay, he said. The situation is critical. Our lives are in danger. He looked earnestly at Fox. I suggest no later than tomorrow night at 12, he said. Fox was agreeable. Will you chair the meeting, he said. Certainly, unless Tawny Owl. Oh, Owl, he probably won't even come. You know what he's like. Can't bear anyone else to arrange anything, grumbled Fox. He must come, insisted Badger. I'll tell him so myself. When the assembly is called, the whole of Farthing Wood has to attend. Five years ago, my father chaired the assembly that was called when the humans first started to build here. There were more of us then, of course. 
Barthingwood was almost a forest in those days, with a large stretch of grassland all around it. And also, yes, yes, Box cut in, a little impatiently. He knew Badger loved to talk about the old days, but once he started it was sometimes very difficult to divert him. We know what it used to be like, he said, but we're concerned about what it would be like at present. My father, he added, in case Badger was offended, was at the assembly, but no good came of it. What could mere animals do? So true, mumbled Badger sadly, but this time, unless we're all to die of thirst, something has got to be done. He turned towards the group of onlookers. Fox and I are agreed that an assembly of the animals of Farthing Wood must be called, he announced. You should all arrive at my set by 12 o'clock tomorrow night. He began to digress again. There's plenty of room for everyone. Once upon a time, many families of badgers lived there, but now I'm the sole survivor. He sighed reminiscently. The last of a long line of farthing wood badgers, going back for centuries. We must spread the word to the others, Fox cut in quickly. You rabbits must find Hare and his family, and field mice, you can pass the word to the voles. Badger knows where to find Weasel, and I myself will look out for Adder and the lizards. Any of you who are about during the daytime can tell the squirrels about it. What about the birds? asked one of the hedgehogs. We'll leave them to Tawny Owl, replied Fox. Badger was right. He must play his part. I'll tell him when I get back home, said Badger. Now don't forget, all of you, 12 o'clock tomorrow night. The smaller animals scurried away, the younger ones chatting excitedly and feeling important because of their duties entrusted upon them. Badger turned to Fox. You'd better impress on Adder, he warned, that we haven't arranged this meeting to provide him with a wonderful opportunity to gorge himself. Remind him that every creature attending an assembly is strictly bound by the oath of common safety. Your father introduced that, I believe. Fox queried. He did, replied Badger seriously. It was necessary to prevent the possibility of bullying or fighting. Do you think Adder will listen to you? As much as he ever does, Fox replied evasively. He shrugged. But I think even Adder respects the rules of the assembly. They stood a little longer, then Badger turned to go. Fox called back to him. What about Mole? he said. Oh, don't worry about him, Badger managed to laugh. Once he hears all the feet running overhead, he'll soon surface to discover what all the commotion is about. Fox grinned. Till tomorrow, then, he said. Till tomorrow, said Badger. Chapter 2. The Assembly By eleven o'clock, Badger felt that everything was ready. Since he had risen, he had been busy enlarging one of the unoccupied chambers of his set to a size which would accommodate everyone who was likely to attend the assembly. Even with his powerful digging claws, it had been exceptionally hard work. The soil was dry and hard. He had to remove all the loose earth once into, the, into one of the unused corridors. Then, outside, he had gathered together several mounds of dry leaves and dragged them down backwards into the chamber, spreading them evenly across the floor. When he had finished, he had sailed out again, this time to the borders of the wood. Underneath the hedgerows, he gathered together a number of glowworms, which he tucked into the thickest parts of his fur, in order to transport them back in bulk. Back at the set, he stowed the little insects at intervals along the entrance corridor, with those that he had left over, he had illuminated the assembly chamber, placing them in tiny clusters, just as he had watched his father do before him. At length, satisfied with his evening's work, he left his set again to dig up a few roots and bulbs for his supper, which he garnished with a number of beetles, made a welcome meal. It was now 11.30 and Badger decided to take a short nap before the other animals started to arrive. He did not seem to have been dozing in his sleeping chamber for more than a few minutes when he heard the old church clock strike 12 in the distance and simultaneously he heard voices outside. He jumped up and wriggled his way 
quickly to the exit. It was Weasel who had arrived with Fox. Go straight down the corridor on your left, Weasel, said Badger. After a little way, it turns to the right. Take the first turn in left after that bend into the assembly chamber and make yourself comfortable. I'll join you in a moment. Weasel followed his directions and the glowworm lights and he had only just disappeared from view when more voices could be heard approaching. They belonged to the rabbits and the hare and his family. Just behind them came the field mice. Fox, will you go down and keep Weasel company? Badger asked. I'd better stay here to direct the others. Of course, said Fox, and bowing his head, he eased himself into the tunnel. This way, everyone, called Badger. Straight in there. He used his snout to indicate the entrance. Just follow the little lights. The rabbits, in their particularly timid manner, were unable to decide on who should be the first to go down the hole, and they began quarrelling until Hare, with some impatience, said, I'll lead. He nudged his mate encouragingly. Come on, dear, and you, and the children. Our cousins and the field mice will be right behind us. The lizards were next to the scene, though Badger did not notice them until they were darting around him like individual threads of quicksilver. After the squirrels, hedgehogs and voles had arrived, only Adder and the birds were missing. The latter arrived together, led by Tawny Owl. He had rounded up Pheasant and his mate, and even Kestrel, who had spent most of his time hovering high in the air above Farthing Wood, had agreed to attend. I didn't deny to, to invite the other birds, explained Tawny Owl. Blackbirds, starlings, pigeons, thrushes, they're all half domesticated. They thrive when humans are around. The more humans there are, the better they'll like it. No purpose in them coming. They don't really represent Farthingwood at all. Do we have to go in there? Pheasant asked Badger in some alarm, soiling our feathers with all that dirt. My set is quite spotless, Badger retorted. I spent all evening getting it ready. We haven't come here to admire each other's plumage, Tawny Owl said shortly. If you haven't anything more to offer the assembly than that, you might as well not have come. I didn't say anything about not attending the assembly, said Pheasant in a small voice, and without further ado, he walked into the hole with his mate, followed by Kestrel. Vain as a peacock, muttered Tawny Owl, and Badger shook his head. You go in, Owl, he said presently. I'm only waiting for Ada, and then we're complete. Just then, Fox's head reappeared at the opening. Mole's just dropped in, he announced with a grin. He came direct, dug a long passage from his tunnel straight into the assembly chamber. Badger laughed. I'd forgotten, Mole, he admitted. Hello, there's Adda. Good evening, gentlemen, Adda whispered as he slid to a halt, his forked tongue flickering all around. I trust I'm not late. I suppose someone had to be last, remarked Fox pointedly. Well, after you, Badger. Inside the assembly chamber, the expectant faces of the young animals contrasted strangely with the solemnity of the seniors in the faint greenish glow. Badger took his place at the centre of the room, flanked by Fox and Tawny Owl as his appointed committee. The other animals spread themselves around evenly, all against the chamber, against the hard earth walls. Most of the field mice and voles and rabbits took care not to sit anywhere near Adder or Weasel. Without ceremony, Badger opened the meeting. This is only the second assembly called in my lifetime, he began, and for most of you it will be the first you've attended. My father called the last assembly five years ago when the humans first moved in to lay waste to our homes. In those days, there was a farthing heath, as well as a farthing wood. I don't have to tell anybody about what happened to the heath that once surrounded the whole of our wood. Gone, all gone, hissed Adder from the corner where he had carefully coiled himself up and was resting his head on an up topmost coil. All gone, echoed the voles. But the humans weren't content with that, Badger went on bitterly. They began to fell our trees. They continued to do so at regular, destructive intervals until, the, until what was once a large wood 
had been cut back to the present sad remnant not much larger than a corpse. What do you think will happen, Badger? asked one of the rabbits timidly. Happen? Badger echoed. Why, the same thing that has been happening. They will cut down more trees and build more houses and shops, probably a school and offices and roads and ghastly concrete posts and signs everywhere, faster and faster and faster until eventually he broke off with a despairing shake of his head. Until eventually we are destroyed with the wood, Tawny Owl finished the sentence with determined pessimism. And all this, how long will it take? asked Hare. The very question I asked myself yesterday, nodded Badger, though all the time I suppose I knew the answer. We animals can never accurately forecast what the humans will do. We only know what they are capable of doing, and they are capable of cutting down the remainder of farthing wood in 12 months, perhaps less. There was a stunned silence for a moment. Then one or two animals coughed nervously. Kestrel began to preen his wings. His livelihood was not as completely threatened as the others by the advancing destruction. And on top of all this, Badger said in pained tones, comes a drought. The very last straw, said Mole. Merely accelerating the end, Tawny Owl muttered more to himself than anyone else. Friends, we are up against the brick wall, Badger intoned with steady seriousness. Leaving aside the threat of our extermination, if we don't in the next couple of days find a safe, secluded place where we can all go to drink, we are all going to find ourselves in the worst kind of distress. He coughed huskily, already feeling his throat to be unusually dry. This is why I've asked all of you to join me tonight. The greater the gathering, the better the chance we have of finding a solution to end our immediate danger. So I entreat you all, don't be afraid to speak up. Size and strength have no bearing on anyone's importance at the assembly. The only important fact is that all of us live in Farthing Wood, and so we all need each other's help. The smaller animals seemed to receive some encouragement from Badger's remarks, and began to murmur to each other and shake their heads in bewilderment but none of them seemed to have any definitive ideas. Badger looked at Horny Owl and then at Fox, but they were both scanning the circle of faces to see who was going to be the first to make a suggestion. Surely you birds can help us, prompted Weasel. You cover a wider stretch of country than we ground dwellers. Can any of you say where the nearest water is to be found outside of our boundaries? Pheasant's dowdy mate shifted uncomfortably as she felt many pairs of eyes turning towards her. Say something, Pheasant, she whispered to him. My mate and I don't really venture outside of the wood, he said hurriedly. Being game birds, there is always the danger of being shot at. He thrusted out his gaudy breast. I'm told we are considered to be great culinary delicacy by all well-bred humans, he added almost smugly. Kestrel, can you offer a more worthwhile piece of information? Badger inquired, directly with a withering glance at Pheasant. Of all the birds present, you spend more time than any outside of the wood. Kestrel stopped preening and looked up with his habitual gl piercing glare. Yes, I can, he said evenly, but I doubt if it will really be of any use. There's a sort of marshy pond on the enclosed army land and the other side of the trunk road. <clears throat> I haven't hunted there for some weeks. It's never really very rewarding at the best of times, but for all I know that, too, that could have dried up as well. Apart from that, the most secluded expanse of water is a goldfish pond in a garden near the old church. But that's in the old village. That's well over a mile away, exclaimed Badger. Is there nowhere else? Oh yes, Kestrel replied without concern. There's a swimming pool in one of the gardens on the new estate. How close? I suppose for you, about 15 minutes travelling. There'd be no cover. No cover at all, Fox warned. I know, Badger answered worriedly, but it's nearer. 
and the smaller animals could never walk as far as the church and then back again all in one night. We could try, piped up one of the field mice. Of course you could, and you could be very brave to do so, said Badger kindly, but that would only be one journey. If this drought continues, we'd all have to make several journeys to drink what we need. The only suggestion I can make, said Hare, is for the larger animals to carry the smaller ones, as many as we can manage. Yes, drawled Ada. I could carry several little mice and voles in my jaws, and I could be so gentle, they wouldn't feel a thing. His tongue flickered excitedly. I should so enjoy carrying the plump ones, he went on dreamily. An owl, you could manage a young rabbit or two in, his ta in your talons, couldn't you? If you're not looking at the situation in the right frame of mind, Adder, admonished Badger, looking with some sympathy to the smaller animals who were huddling together as far away from Adder as they could possibly manage without actually bolting into the tunnel. If you're merely thinking, as usual, he went on, of a way in which you can benefit personally from it. I know what you're thinking, and it won't do. It won't do at all. We're a community facing a dangerous crisis. You know the oath. Just a suggestion, he said that with a scarcely disguised leer. He was quite undismayed from the effect his words had had on the field mice and their voles. Now calm down, mice, soothed Badger. Calm down, rabbits. You will come to no harm in my set. When the assembly appeared to be more relaxed again, one of the squirrels said, Could we dig for water? Badger looked towards Mole. The latter shook his black velvet head. No, I don't think it's really possible, he said. We'd only be wasting our energy, I'm afraid. There was silence then. While every animal cajoled his brains for ways of out of the difficulty, the seconds ticked by. Suddenly, a voice could be heard from the long passage outside. Hello? Who's there? Who's there? Weasel ran to the tunnel. I can see something moving, he said. Then he called out, This is Weasel. The other animals are here too. Good heavens, it's Toad, he exclaimed. I've been looking all over the place for everyone, the newcomer as he stumbled into the chamber. I've been so worried. I thought you'd all deserted the wood. Then I heard voices. He sat down to regain his breath, and I noticed the lights. Toad, whatever happened to you? Badger cried as all the other animals gathered around him. We'd given up on you for lost. Wherever have you been? We haven't seen you since last spring, and you're so thin. My dear chap, tell us what's happened. I, I've been on a long journey, Toad said. I'll tell you all about it when I've got my breath back. Have you had anything to eat recently? Badger asked with concern. Oh yes, I'm not hungry, he replied, just tired. The heaving of his speckled chest gradually quietened as he recovered from his exertions. The other animals waited patiently for him to begin. He looked warily around his audience. I was captured, you know, he exclaimed. It happened last spring at the pond. They, they took me a long way away, oh, miles away. I thought I'd never see any of you again. He paused and some of the animals made soothing sympathetic noises. Eventually, though, I managed to escape, Toad went on. I was lucky, of course. I knew I had to make my way back here, to the pond where I was born, so I started out that very day. And ever since, except during the winter months, I managed to get a little nearer, little by little, mile by mile, covering as much ground as I was able to each day. Fox looked at Badger, and Badger nodded sadly. Toad. Toad, old fellow, I, I'm afraid there's some bad news for you, Fox said with some difficulty. Very bad news. Toad looked up quickly. What, what is it? He faltered. Your pond has gone. They filled it in. Chapter 3, Toad's Story Toad looked at Fox with an expression of disbelieving horror. But, but they couldn't, he whispered. I was born there. My parents were born there. All my relatives and acquaintances. 
and with every spring we have a reunion. Toads all around leave their hand, land homes and make for their birthplace. They couldn't take that away from us. He looked pathetically from one sad face to another, almost compelling someone to deny this awful piece of information. But he received no answer. Filled all of it in. Is it quite gone? Toad's voice shook. I'm afraid so, Badger mumbled. But you know there was very little of it left, really. With this drought, the water had nearly all dried up anyway. He knew his words were of no comfort. But what about all the other toads? Toad asked hoarsely. I think they'd probably left the pond before this happened, Fox said encouragingly. After all, it is May now. Yes, yes, Toad agreed morosely. Morosely. I'm late. It's not spring anymore, really. Not that we toads call, call it spring. This drought, Badger rejoined, is a danger for all of us. That's why I called this assembly. There's no water left, Toad. None anywhere in Farthing Wood. We just don't know what to do. Toad did not reply. His downcast face took on a new expression. He looked considerably more hopeful. I've got it, he exclaimed excitedly. We'll leave, all of us. Well, if I could do it, so can you. Leave Farthing Wood, Badger queried with some alive. Ha uh, I'm alarmed, sorry. How could we? What do you mean? Yes, yes, let me explain. Toad stood up in his excitement. I know the very place to go to. Oh, it's miles away, of course, but I'm sure we could manage it together. The other animals began to chatter all at once, and Badger completely failed to quiet them. We must face the facts, Toad cried. What you've just told me about the pond has brought our danger home to me with a jolt. Farthing Wood is finished. In another couple of years, it won't even exist. We must all find a new home. Now before it's too late. The other voices broke off. Toad's voice dropped to a whisper. The nature reserve, he announced dramatically. We shall all go to the nature reserve, where we can live in peace again. And I can, sh I can be your guide. He looked around triumphantly. Dear, dear, I, I don't know. Badger shook his striped head. You'd better tell us about it, Toad. I don't know if this is a good idea. If it's so far, go on, Toad. Fox broke in. Tell us about your adventure, right from the beginning. Toad sank back into his accustomed, comfortable squat and cleared his throat. You'll recall how last spring was very warm, in March particularly, he began. Well, one weekend, there was a tremendous number of humans at the pond. Young ones with their horrible nets and glass jars. A lot of them had brought their parents along. Everything in the pond was in a panic. There seemed to be no escape anywhere. The young humans were even wading out into the middle of the pond with their eagerness to capture us. I remember I dived under water and tried to hide in the mud at the bottom. So did a lot of others, but it was no use. They found me, and I was prodded into a jam jar and carried away. How awful for you, one of the lizards commiserated. They come after us too, with those stifling glass jars that are made specially slippery so you can hardly get a grip on the bottom. Ghastly things, muttered Toad. I must have been kept in it for three or four hours, I should think. I was submitted to the indignity of watching my captures eat their food by the side of my pond while I was left out in the sun, trying frustratingly to scale the sides of the jar without so much of the leaf to protect me. If the weather had been any hotter, I'm sure I would have dried up. I like to sunbathe myself, said Ada, but of course you amphibians have never really learnt to live comfortably on the dry land. Just the same as you reptiles cannot adapt to swimming in the dive-in, retorted Toad. I can swim when I have to, Ada returned. Well, well, nodded Badger. What happened next, Toad? They took me away, he said. I don't know for sure how far, because I took the opportunity of having a nap during the journey. They put me in the back of their car 
and the next thing I knew I was being tipped into a glass box in their garden. How long did they keep you in this glass box? asked Fox. I suppose about four weeks, replied Toad. They put some netting on the top as a lid, and one day their wretched cat, who was always prowling around trying to get at me, knocked it off. So I leapt as high as I could and managed to jump out of the box and hide in the shed. That very night, I started my journey home. I hadn't got very far before I decided I ought to strengthen myself with a good meal. All the humans had ever given me was meal worms, tasty enough, but so boring without some change to relieve my diet. I still think I cannot beat a juicy earthworm, fresh and moist from its burrow. Here, here, cried Mull, feelingly. Nothing like them. I could eat them till I burst, never tire of them. It's a wonder there are many left at all with your appetite, remarked Tawny Owl. Oh, nonsense. There are plenty for everyone, Mole justified himself a little shamefacedly. Though during this dry weather, I have my work cut out trying to find them. They do go down so deep, you know. Yes, of course, said Toad. Anyway, when I had eaten my fill, and my first problem was to get out of the garden, the great difficulty lay in getting around the wall. There was no wooden fence with convenient gaps in it, just a stone wall around the garden. However, I was determined not to be disheartened, and there was one thing in my favour. The wall had bits of pebble and flint stuck into it, for decoration perhaps, I don't know, and I know that I could use these projecting pieces to climb up. It took so long, however, that I was sure daylight would break before I'd reached the top, particularly as I fell off about four times and had to start again. But I knew I had to get up that wall, even to have the chance of setting out for farthing wood. Well, I got to the top eventually and walked along to the end of the wall. By that time, it was starting to get light, and I knew I would have to jump for it. I looked all around for a plant or something to break my fall, but there was nothing, only concrete all around. Of course, I couldn't possibly risk jumping onto that. So I had to lower my legs over the edge and climb down the pebbles again. Fortunately, it didn't take as long going up. So I just think, so I was just thinking I could probably jump the last few inches when that horrible cat came out of the house. I pressed myself close to the wall and froze. Toad broke off and contemplated his enthralled audience. The room was completely, utterly silent, so that you could have heard a pine needle drop. The young squirrels had wrapped themselves cosily in their mother's thick tails, and the field mice and voles were now all bunched together in a large furry mass, which was animated only by a score or so of quivering pink noses. Every animal gave Toad his rapt attention. Only Adder appeared to be taking no further interest in the proceedings, he had allowed his head to drop forward, but whether he was asleep or not would have been difficult to say. Would you believe me, Toad went on quickly, if I told you that I stayed in that spot all day, trying to look like another pebble? I couldn't risk climbing down any further. There was nowhere to hide, and if that cat had seen me, it would have been the end of me. Fortunately, the day was reasonably cool, and so soon as it was safely dark, I let myself drop the rest of the way to the ground and then crawled and hoped, hopped as far as I could away from the house. There were only one or two other houses nearby and once I got past them I began to feel much freer. My sense of direction told me that the course to take and I uh, told me the course to take and I kept on down to the end of the road. This was sealed off by some sort of ditch and behind that a fence, which I knew was on the right route. And those two things didn't present much of a barrier to me. I hadn't gone far on the other side when I realised I must be in some sort of private park, because the fence stretched as far as I could see in both directions. Now I don't know exactly why it was, but the more I looked at the fence, the safer it felt. I suppose it was because I knew I was on the right side of it. It was very quiet and peaceful in there, and a lovely bright moon was shining as I made my way along, flicking up, 
a few insects on the way. I decided to make my bed under some trees, so I scooped out a little hole in the earth and pulled some dry leaves around me. I slept quite well during the day, because apart from the birds, no one seemed to be about. It was dusk, I emerged again and continued forward. After a while, the trees gave way to some open land, and ahead of me I would sense some water. You can't imagine how excited I became at that. After all those weeks without a dip, it was another bright moonlit night, and eventually I could see a pond ahead. There, the moon was reflected perfectly. As I approached, I thought I could hear one or two croaks coming from the water. I realised I had not been mistaken when the whole party of the pond's inhabitants started croaking in unison, making a tremendous racket. It was a call I couldn't place, unlike, I, unlike any I'd heard before. They were obviously frogs, but what sort of frogs? As I didn't know if they were likely to be friendly, I approached the water's edge cautiously and just watched them for a while. There seemed to be quite a number of them splashing about in the centre of the pool, and some were just floating with their heads just out of the water. These were the ones making the noise. They were blowing out their cheeks like two, like two bubbles in the effort to croak the loudest. After I'd been there for a little while, they stopped croaking and seemed to decide amongst themselves that it was time to leave the water. They began to make for sure, some swimming in my direction. I stood my ground. As they clambered out, one of them called. We've got a visitor, a toad. They came up to have a look, remarking that they hadn't seen me before and that the toads who shared their pond in the spring had all gone for a week or more to make their homes on land. They made quite a fuss at me when I told them my story. They explained to me that they had just left the pond to feed and invited me to join them. There was no shortage of food and we were all able to eat our fill. Although it was night time, I was still able to discover that these unusual frogs were a definitive shade of green with darker spots and a stripe of pale colour in the centre of their back. When we had finished eating, they asked me to join them for a swim and I was glad to accept. We swam out to the centre and resting amongst the water weed and I took the opportunity of asking them about the park. Their spokesman was an old, fat male who seemed to be a sort of patriarch of their society. He told me the park was called White Deer Park, and it was a nature reserve. Toad paused for effect, and there were obligated murmurs of, ah, and of course, the nature reserve. We have heard of these nature reserves, reserves, said Badger. Do they, in fact, reserve nature? Exactly as implies, Toad answered emphatically. My friends, the frogs, told me all about it. A nature reserve is a piece of land or water of exceptional value and interest because of the rare animals or plants or both in it. There is a certain breed of human called a natu naturalist who will, unlike most ordinary humans, spends his time learning about and caring for animals and plants. Their prime consideration is our well-being and safety. The frogs told me these usually work in groups, and it was one of these groups that decided that their homeland, White Deer Park, was too valuable to be left unprotected. So about three years ago, it was sealed off, designated a reserve, and now no humans are permitted entry to it without a special pass. Even then, they may not remove any animal or plant from the reserve whatsoever. It sounds wonderful, said Hare's mate. Peace and security all the time. No hiding, no running away, no guns. And that's not all, Toad went on. The reserve is under the permanent care of one of the naturalists, who is called a warden. The animal's health and safety is in his keeping, and he patrols the reserve to ensure their protection. Apparently, in the frog's park, there is a herd of albino deer, which is unique. They call themselves... They themselves are a colony of rare frogs, called edible frogs, by the humans. Although, luckily, no one is allowed to eat them. There is also an unusual type of water plant in their pond, and they believe one or two rare butterflies feed in the park. 
but they assured me that there is also a good representation of the commoner animals, like ourselves, who live there and benefit from the protection. It sounds like a paradise, breathed Badger. I can't think why you'd want to leave it. Fox looked at him meaningfully, and Badger went on quickly. That's it, of course. I understand why you did. But, but tell me, Toad, how far is it? It's taking you months to get here. It's certainly a long way, agreed Toad. I wouldn't deny it. I spent a week with the frogs and then explained to them that I had to go on. Of course, they understood perfectly. Is it a large park? asked Fox. One of the frogs told me that he had heard of it being about 500 acres, which, as you can imagine, would be more than the whole of all, all of Farthing Wood. And I mean the old wood, as it used to be. Anyway, it took about another week to cross the park completely. Then, every day after that, I pressed on, never staying more than one day in one place. I travelled mostly in the dark hours, finding it convenient to hide in places during the day. I ate what I could on the move, and so the weeks went on. I must tell you that I was constantly buoyed up by the thought that every day, every step or hop brought me closer to my friends. Good old Toad, said Badger under his breath. When I noticed the weather was beginning to get colder, I tried to hurry. I could sense there was not a tremendous distance left, but I wanted to get home before the winter really arrived. But I knew if I didn't eat properly and the winter overtook me, I would die. So I compromised. I kept going, but at a more leisurely pace, eating as much as I could find every night. Finally, I knew it was time to hibernate. The other frogs and toads and lizard too that I had encountered during the previous week or so had been looking for a comfortable roost, and I found one on some farmland. I chose a grassy bank by a ditch where there was plenty of cover. Food was becoming scarce by now, and I spent all day picking up what I could. Then, as night was approaching, I dug myself a nice hole under the large stone and settled into that. It was really quite cold by then, and I felt sleepy. So sleepy that I went out like a light as soon as I closed my eyes. Well, there I stayed until the warm spell at the beginning of March woke me up. And then I had a good meal in an ant's nest and set off again, and the rest you know really. A brave fellow indeed, remarked Badger, warmly. Very courageous, agreed Weasel. What tremendous perseverance, com commented Fox. I've always admired you toads for that. Once started on something, you just won't be diverted. I'd do it again gladly if you'd all come with me, said Toad. That's fighting talk, cried Badger. How about it, everyone? Shall Toad be our guide to our new home? And a fresh start for everybody, Toad said, away from the threat that we've been living here for, under for so long. There was a deafening chorus of agreement. Then it's farewell to Farthing Wood. There were more shouts of approval. The animals were excited now. Better to say, welcome to White Deer Park, said Mole. Now, Mole, don't get carried away, said Badger kindly. We haven't even taken our first step yet. You know that. Mole grinned. Badger looked around the chamber. Are there any dissent dissent dissenters? He asked formally and studied every individual face. There was no reply. Then I take it as unanimous. We go to White Deer Park. So I'm going to stop there at the end of chapter three of the Animals of Farthing Wood, just as they're about to start their journey um, off to White Deer Park. Um, obviously, the TV show, I think, captures the emotion a, a lot. So anyone who does have those memories, it's very easy to um to jump straight into the book and in your mind you're constantly thinking of the animals and their characters and personalities um, but what i think is really lovely about this book is that clearly that wasn't just made up for the cartoon the animals characters and everything the, there's a richness of content directly from the book and i highly recommend that people um, borrow from their libraries when they're available um and or have a copy for their own home library so that you can enjoy the rest of the Animals of Bath and Wood. This is actually a really nice particular copy. And what's 
really what I particularly like is the all the uh, um, animals the illustrations look pretty serious apart from Toad and Toad is actually extremely cute <laughs> down there um, but yeah so I hope you've enjoyed um, our story of the animals of Farthing Wood um, thank you for joining me thank you for joining Pooh Bear um, stay safe out there and we'll see you for the next one bye say bye Pooh